Hey everybody, welcome to today's episode of Real Estate Disruptors. Today, as you can see, looks a little different. What we want to offer you is a preview to our new podcast, Close More Sales with Ian Ross. If you don't know Ian, Ian actually runs our sales community. And for this episode of Close More Sales, he'll be interviewing me about my sales journey. Why are we talking about sales? Well, we know sales is the fastest way to become a millionaire. So happy New Year's, and I hope you enjoy the show. Comfort is irrelevant. If this will lead to more revenue, if this will lead to a better paycheck, I will do the uncomfortable thing. Doing the comfortable thing, doing the easy way out, if that's your standard or if that's how you live, don't be in sales. Hey everyone, and welcome to the Close More Sales Podcast. Our purpose is to empower sales professionals and entrepreneurs to push themselves to grow, achieve unimaginable success without burning out, and ultimately transform their lives. I'm Ian Ross, and I'm obsessed with all things sales. And I work with teams across the country to make more money by asking better questions. The most proven path to achieving financial freedom is maximizing your earning potential. And a sales role is the lowest barrier at the highest possible ceiling for entry onto that path. Anyone can become a killer salesperson with the right techniques, mindset, and consistency. Everything we cover on this podcast is geared toward one thing, helping you close more sales so you can live the life you want. Now, this is a new podcast, so we're in the growth stage. If you get any value from this episode today, Follow, subscribe, and let us know either in the comments on YouTube or in a review wherever you listen to podcasts and tell us what you got out of the show. If you have conversations where how well you speak determines how much money you can make, you are in a sales role. And if you'd like to get better at what you do, text CLOSE, C-L-O-S-E, to 33777, and we'll see if we can help you out along the process. Now, I have with me today the one and only Steve Trang, who most of you probably know either from the Real Estate Disruptors podcast, Pardon the Disruption, Certainty Talks, or you've seen clips and videos from his sales training on YouTube or social media. But what most of you don't know is he's actually the reason I'm sitting here right now with this close more sales thing behind me and the reason I moved my young family to Phoenix, Arizona. So Steve, welcome to the Close More Sales podcast. Thank you for having me. This is something that we've envisioned for a very long time and uh, I'm excited for this launch. Awesome, yeah, me too. Uh, I wanna start and get right into it with a, a question that's been on my mind mm -hmm. for a while, which is simply like, it, how would your life be right now if you had never gotten into real estate and by extension sales? Talk me through that version of Steve Trang. Well, I can't imagine a world where I don't work for myself, right? So I knew from the, from the get-go, uh, I was not gonna stay a W-2 employee. I just knew that from the very beginning. I was always entrepreneurial growing up. So my plan when I worked at Intel was they had a seven year thing where after seven years, you got a sabbatical, you got a two month vacation paid for by Intel and all your stock options vest, right? And so I always knew that at that seven year mark, I was gonna take my two month vacation and quit my job. So I was gonna do something else. I, my plan was I had to find a wife with health insurance benefits. <laughs> that, was, that was like the only thing to stop me from uh, going on and, and, and doing something else. So I knew it was gonna be uh, working for myself, what I thought was a very real possibility was being a contractor, a mercenary for hire for engineering, right? That, I thought that was a very real possibility. I never thought about a sales career, right? But a sales career is naturally what happens when you get into real estate uh, to sell real estate. But that wasn't the right plan initially either. The, the whole plan was just to buy rental properties and create financial freedom. Right. So I think it was just a function and a very early indicator of my massive shiny object syndrome. That got me from working a job to, hey, let's buy some rental properties to, hey, I should be a realtor to where we are today. So how far into being a realtor did you realize this is actually a sales role and I need to improve my sales skills? Uh, pretty early on. Um, I, I was working on my sales skills in the very beginning. Um, I was listening to CDs in the car. I wish I knew the title of those CDs because I borrowed them from my broker. and. I use some of those philosophies today. So like when I'm quoting things, like I don't, I don't know who said it, it's because I don't know the actual CD sure. uh, that I got it from. But yeah, I mean, from the get-go, there was those CDs. It was Zig Ziglar, lots of Zig Ziglar. 
you know, um, I can't remember the exact title uh, uh, of his book, but he's got some great material out there on, on being not necessarily a better salesperson, but how to act and behave like a salesperson. So not, so not the technical part, right? but the, uh, the activities part, the, the mindset stuff. So there's a lot of amazing content from Zig Ziglar early on in my career. Is that some of the first stuff you started with, really focusing on following a process and the mindset before you got more tactical and thinking about the techniques for sales? Well, the greatest challenge, I think today still, um, but definitely when I started in 07, was there really wasn't a lot of great sales tactics, mm. or at least the ones that were out there were really, really hard to find. Right. Um, and so, you know, I've learned a lot from the Sandler selling system. And one of the things I heard from David Sandler from one of his live events, I, record, I listened to his live events in the past, and it was like, I should have way more clients than I have, but you salespeople are being selfish and not telling other successful or other salespeople what techniques they're using to grow your business. So like, I need you guys to go out there and tell everyone else that my stuff is good so that I can have a better lifestyle. So for whatever reason, Sandler was never, ever on my radar, right? We had question-based selling. Uh, we have, uh, uh, what's that um, book about prospecting? Um, I can't think of it off the top of my head right now. But there are a lot of different books out there, again, on like adjusting and modifying your behavior. Right. And there's some stuff that are super tactical on you know what to say for this specific objection. But there was no sales framework. Right. Uh, that was, again, prevalent uh, until I would say very, very recently. Got it. Okay. Well, I'm curious because I actually don't know this. Could you, do you remember your first sale in real estate, the first time you actually sold a piece of real estate? Would you be willing to sort of walk me through that sale? Uh, well, it was shoddy and clunky, right? Sure. It's, and that my proudest moment. And really, I had unrealistic expectations when I first got into sales. Because uh, first, I didn't see real estate as a sales role, as a realtor. I didn't feel like it was a sales role. And it was probably way too long, multiple years, where I treated being a salesperson like a bad thing. Right? Like, I don't want to be a pushy salesperson. I don't want to bother people. And that was my mindset in early on in my career. And that inhibited me. Right? And what certainly didn't help was that what I was selling, I was selling to friends and family. Because as a realtor, where do you start off? With sphere of influence. Sure. So you start off with your friends and family. And I was uh, you know, going around. Actually, uh, my first opportunity I was, when I was working for this broker was there was this condo conversion where they were selling all these uh, uh, apartments that they converted into condos. And that you know, we're, we're selling these based off of return on investment. So I was already working at Intel uh, in Chandler. But I started at Intel in Sacramento. I actually flew to Sacramento. I was like, hey, I got all these friends that make a lot of money that should invest. And so I went to go and talk to all of them about this opportunity over here. And not one was interested in talking to me about it. Not one was uh, wanting to have a conversation about it. So like all these people that I hung out with that I consider friends, now we're like, uh, you're a salesperson now. I don't really want to spend time with you. And it was really fascinating to see this dynamic. Of like, are you, are you talking to me about this? because you're trying to make money off of this, or do you believe in it? Right. And I absolutely believed in it. And so now this uh, hurt my ego. I was like, you trusted me with like all these other important conversations, right? Like where I'm gonna live, what should I buy this, should I not buy this, relationships. And now I'm no longer this trustworthy person because I'm a salesperson. Right. You have the title of salesperson and therefore naturally people have a shield up when you're trying to talk yeah, to them. Yeah, the guard went up. And yeah. I was like, I've never experienced this guard. Because I've always been a person prior to that when they had like, hey, what do you think about this? I was always in that like consultant circle. Yeah. Right? Like, hey, Steve's a friend. I can pick up and he'll talk to me and walk me through this. Like what his thoughts are. I was never shy about my thoughts. Right? And so I, I was always a great problem solver. But now that I'm a salesperson, I'm not a trustworthy person to talk about things. Sure. How did you start to overcome that? What was the process there? Uh, well, it, I didn't do a very good job of overcoming it. As a matter of fact, I'm still not a great person uh, to, to deal with it with friends and family. Hmm. Uh, but on the other side, I, I want to say after a few years, I fully embraced being a salesperson, right? 
Uh, but the problem was, even though I fully embraced being a salesperson, I was still a crappy salesperson. Mm. So first, it was, I'm a crappy salesperson, but that's okay, because salespeople suck. So like, no, I am a salesperson. I embrace this role, but I really suck at this. To now, there's a process where I can actually walk someone through, and have a quality conversation that's highly consultative, uh, with high trust, lower in the guard, and now we're actually solving people's problems. So uh, how I solved it with friends and family, I haven't solved it. <laughs> but with strangers, pretty good at it. Got it. Okay. What were some of those other sort of, or I guess, what were, were there any sort of fears or doubts you had once you're, now you're in real estate, you're having conversations mm -hmm. where money's on the line, you're no longer at Intel. What were some of the fears and doubts going through your head in that role once you sort of embraced that? I'm a salesperson, but I'm still not good at it yet. Yeah, I think the biggest thing is not wanting to uh, come across as pushy. Mm. You know, uh, not because what is what is the one place that everyone has anxiety walking into? It's a car dealership, and so I don't want to give this pushy feel. So it's always been my my fear. So in talking to friends and family, I, I still have a little bit not today, but for the longest time I had this thing where like I don't come across as pushy salesperson. Mm. So that doubt really really uh, uh sat with me for way way too long it wasn't even until recently i can say got it and that doubt so how did that translate to the negativity you weren't doing some of the things that you i wasn't doing the behaviors that i was supposed to do so as a realtor uh you're supposed to reach out to their friends and family hey ian do you know anyone that's looking to buy or sell a home in the next six to 12 months right i'm supposed to have conversations on a regular basis ask these questions but the precursor was having these, what I considered inauthentic conversations. Mm. Hey, Ian, how's your family doing? Uh, you know, you got any, small talk. Yeah, you got yeah. anything planned this holiday weekend, right? Christmas right around the corner. You got anything fun? And I had to have these conversations with you about your life and your family that if you know me well, it's just not on my top list of things that says on my mind, right? And it's not that I don't care about your family. It's just how your family's doing is not like the things I wake up and I think about. Right. Right. So when I call you and say, hey, you know, how's family? How are you doing? It feels grossly inauthentic. And then after all that, right, because I have to do the small talk first. Then it's like, so Ian, you know, you happen to know anyone that's looking to buy a sell home in the next six or 12 months? You know, by the way, I like to work by referral. And there's like this whole spiel. And right. it just felt so scripted and inauthentic. And I'm not going to say that people could pick up on it. But for sure, it felt inauthentic. And that's definitely not helping business. Got it. So you felt inauthentic, and even if they couldn't necessarily pick on it, it was it wasn't help, it wasn't serving you having that. It wasn't doubt. me. Yeah, yeah, definitely wasn't me. Do you think that's a challenge for a lot of realtors that they experience that same type of thing? I'm sure it's a massive challenge for a lot of realtors. It's probably a challenge for anyone that has a product to sell right. that requires selling to your sphere of influence. I mean, look at it. What do we do every time someone posts anything about an MLM on, on Facebook? We roll our eyes yeah. and quietly judge them or judge them on the side. Behind their back, right? Not so quietly with other people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Like you look at like the one for the longest time Facebook was, uh, it works. I right? remember like that bandage thing and like people post about it. And so uh, there's a, uh, uh, what's the other one? The juice thing. Like <laughs> it's not for Micah, but it sounds like like Malayuka. I think. Yeah. One of those. Yeah. Right. So you see people post on it. It's like no one wants to talk to that person anymore. So anytime like you're an MLM, it's the same thing as a salesperson. Probably the exact same experience. Once you're a salesperson or once you're an MLM, which is a sales role, but once you're MLM, it's like, let's do everything we can to stay, you know, arm's length from that guy. I had a lot of that myself, I'll admit. <laughs> I'm, my first commissioned only sales role was life insurance. I remember even before getting in life insurance, seeing someone who was in life insurance and then posting about how great it is mm -hmm. and everyone being like, wow, I can't believe how sad this is. This guy's <laughs> fall, like he's like tumbling down a, yeah. a canyon basically for posting about what he does for work and mm -hmm. believing in it. And there's the, the natural doubt and mockery that comes from, oh, I'm a salesperson. Let me put my product and my services mm -hmm. out there. People, yeah. people judge you. Absolutely. Um, so after that, I, I you recall that first sale being with friends and family, not so good. Mm -hmm. Do you remember a time when you were starting to utilize some of the techniques, maybe something you picked up from watching stuff around Sandler or mm -hmm. you know, listening to those other tapes from the broker where you went in to a home, you ran your consultation, you did techniques and you got the sale. Mm -hmm. Can you remember a time where like when you started feeling that transition or, or that yeah, happened? Yeah, I would say I didn't really have a great sales process. I had a process, but it was fairly inconsistent. 
Uh, I would say that once I joined a coaching program, which is unfortunately way too way too late in my career, right? Like I started at 07, I didn't get into coaching until like uh, the end of 2010. Then I followed their process and it worked. Looking back, it was a horrific sales process. However, it was a process I followed consistently. So because it was a process that I was committed to following, I knew the objections that were gonna come. Right. And I was prepared to handle those objections because we have like, you know, book of magic answers like here are the objections you're going to get what's your commission right is it negotiable what are you going to do to market my home so we had these uh, lists of negotiation or, or, or objections ready to, to you know handle but looking back like the sales process we have today those objections are like meaningless like we just walk over them right but we force those objections to come because we had a crappy process right right yeah i would say i mean a bad process is definitely better than no process at yeah. all because you can iterate and improve on it and right. memorize certain steps and certain techniques and prepare for certain things, even yeah. though you're suboptimal. Yeah. So having a process you're opposed to, because <laughs> you're opposed to sales, to having, well, okay, I'm a salesperson, but I don't have a good process too. Like, here's a bad process. Definitely improved sales. So you're running a not ideal process, but you're starting to have things work. Mm -hmm. How did you sort of keep that momentum going or what was your process internally to look at what you were doing and try and find ways to sort of improve it? So the right answer probably would have been to continue to get better, getting better at sales. Uh, what I did instead was resign myself to like, oh, well, I just suck at sales and that's just the way it is. Um, because I, I'm not pushy, right? right? Like I need to think about it. I was like, yeah, I understand. I would want to think about it too. And so what I did, my solution to this was not to continue improving on sales because I thought I had capped out on what I could learn because I've looked all the sales trainings what was out there and i thought i capped out and so my solution then to solving this problem because i was good at marketing this time i was doing all my own marketing this time was to just hire pushy salespeople, right like all right i'll get the phones to ring you go get the deal you go get the business and that worked yeah. i mean that was the process where i became uh top 40 in the phoenix market as a realtor of forty five thousand realtors right top 40 consistently so top you know fraction of percent by being good at marketing and hiring salespeople that won't take no for an answer. That was a process, that was a system that worked. Is it my proudest moment? No, but I don't regret it either because that was just an iteration to where we are today. Sure, sure, got it, okay. Uh, so when did you, well, like, how long were you doing that for? Like, what was the process? That was then? from, I wanna say 2012, 2013. See, I opened my brokerage in 2013. So uh, I would say 2012, before I opened my brokerage, and I ran that model um, until, let's see, uh, when I move away from, because even though I evolved, I've always had a team afterwards. So I wouldn't say I moved away from that model necessarily as much as we've improved our sales process along the way. Okay. So the, the, it's not necessarily you changed the model. It's just that the improving part was in the process and the training. We had more service orientation. We had more listening, <laughs> asking better questions. And that started in 18. So in 2018, we had a sales process that was different than the previous process of here's my presentation, blah, blah, blah. But actually having a sales process that was seller oriented or customer facing, that's good for them. I was starting in 18. What oriented the change in 2018 for you to start doing that? Uh, well, it was actually getting sales training, you know? Mm -hmm. So I was un oblivious to effective sales training for the longest time. And it was only because uh, at this time, right? So I have my brokerage, I'm a wholesaler, right? So I'm a, I have a brokerage, I'm a wholesaler. And being a, owning a brokerage, whenever we needed some contractor help, I had this contractor, Pace Morby. A lot of people have heard this guy, right? So he's my GC that I would refer to my clients. So he's a general contractor, I'm a broker, and I'm wholesaling and he owns a Homevestor franchise. I was like, hey, Pace, like, send me your deals. And he's like, well, I can't, you know, I, I have to sell them to Jamil. I was like, yeah, Jamil and I are friends. You can sell, you can sell them to me too. He's like, no, I got to sell them to Jamil. But I'm not taking no for an answer because like we're friends, right? And so as I keep pestering him, he was saying, look, if you're trying to do more deals, like why don't you just hang out with all those Homevestor guys? Like, There's a place where all Homevestor guys hang out that I can be there at. It's not like a Homevestor meeting. He's like, no, there's like the place where we all meet. It's like, well, tell me more about it. It's like it's a Sandler office. It's like, okay, let me look at what Sandler thing is, right? So I schedule an appointment, I go in there, and I talk to this guy, uh, and he's a Sandler sales coach, and I sign up for it because 
it's a room home investor, guys. There's no way I'm not making money in there. Sure. Uh, and I was willing to pay up to 20. So he only got me for seven. Right. So I get into that room. I was like, this guy actually is an effective sales coach. He is able to put together all these pieces, except for one. There's only one piece I was missing up until this point. He's able to put all the pieces together in a way that I just had all these pieces all over the place that just didn't quite fit. Right. And so the only thing he added to it, not the only thing, but the biggest thing he added to, uh, to it was the, the delivery, the tonality, right? Say these things in this way. I had the words, right? The, the words are in the books, right? But the tonality and delivery was where it, it, it uh, and, and a process, but um, I would say the biggest thing for me was, was the, the, the tonality and delivery. And once I had that, it's like, oh, yeah, scrap everything we've got. This is what we're doing moving forward. Okay. So that was, and that was 2018? That was 18. Okay. So thinking about how you have a sales process today for running an appointment and let's say end of 2018, if you can sort of recall back, what are sort of the changes that you've made since you adopted some of the stuff you learned in Sandler and some of the other things you were doing to how you've adopted running things now? What's that gap, how has the process changed since then, if it's changed at all? Uh, the biggest gap is having a process where we're setting appropriate expectations at the beginning of the appointment, right? Because before, you just come in, you do a small talk, let's be friends. Right. Can I do a presentation for you, right? And then I go for the close and then handle objections, which is a sales process. Sure. Right? Uh, so now it's like, hey, like before we even get into it, like, you know, um, can I just share with you how these appointments go? And then we set expectations. Whereas, a very, very kind and courteous, professional way as possible. Hey, I need a yes or no, uh, you know, and just promise me you're not, promise me you won't think about it, right? So that was the first thing. Second thing, we all know that people buy emotionally and justify logically, and all these books all said find pain. Like, there's not a sales book that doesn't say like you gotta find pain, right? Find the pain, push it, right? But they don't tell you how, right? So it's like it's like a, it's like an afterthought in the book, and so now we have like. We spend 40% or more of the time in pain. And if you're not spending at least 40% of the time in pain, you're probably not getting a good contract, right? If we can't find the motivation, then nothing else matters. Right. Right. And so uh, now we spend a good amount of time in, in, uh, in pain and motivation and ultimately how they feel about all this. And then the, the last thing, which we never did before, is prevent remorse. Right. Hey, Ian, sometime between now and when we when things finally close, we're probably gonna have some thoughts like, do you know that I make the right choice? You know, did, did, did I do the right thing? We'll let you know like that's a completely normal thought. It's normal, right? And so then like two days later, like, God, did I make the right decision? Oh, Steve said that I was gonna have these thoughts. Oh, it's normal. Okay. And then it's like it's not a major issue. So I would say that's the third thing that we added that was definitely not there before. Before I was like, gotta sign a contract, get out of here as fast as possible. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And was an aspect of realizing that need to happen, just understanding that's just another version of setting expectations for the It's just another version of setting expectations. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Why do you think most salespeople don't set expectations the right way? Is it because they're just unaware, they're afraid to do it? What do you think some of the hesitation is around there? I would say predominantly is a lack of awareness. Yeah. Lack of awareness of, of the need for it, right? Because it's, it's, that's one of those things that, it's obvious when you hear it. Right? Right. That's what common sense is. Common sense is something that makes sense after you hear it. But prior to hearing it, you just did it completely opposite way. I mean, another example. Uh, I, I learned snowboarding from a buddy. I didn't take lessons. Right? I learned it from a buddy. And what would I do every time I got off the lift? Just fall off. <laughs> you just lose control and you fall off. And he was like, because uh, you put, you know, you got the one that's this, the, the uh, snowboard that's attached to your leg and the other one that's not, right? He's like, and so what you do is when you get off is you put your foot, your, your side with that's attached first, and then you put the board, right, on the snow, and then you come down. And what you do, what I did, was I would just do that and then fall off. He's like, why don't you just take your foot out and just catch yourself? Like, that's just an obvious thing. <laughs> right? And so what, what happens after that? I don't fall anymore. It's so obvious right. when someone points it out. And you feel like an idiot when they point it out. But it's not something you necessarily think of. Right. Right. Your thing here is like, just don't fall. And then, so setting expectations. I think step one is a lack of awareness. But after the awareness, 
the courage to do it because it is an uncomfortable conversation. But you know what's also uncomfortable? Closing. Right. So let's just get all that discomfort out of the way early, right? So I would say predominantly is a lack of awareness. Then after the awareness, people still don't do it because it's uncomfortable. But I don't think that's as big a deal because it's a pretty easy sale after, they're, after we're able to uh, get people aware of it. Were you uncomfortable doing it when you first started? I was. Yeah. But I was also committed to process. Right. And I am, I am committed to doing things the right way for optimal success, right? Uh, that goes back to my failed poker days, right? It goes back to engineering, uh, expected value. Um, so it, it goes to basketball when I practice, it goes to Kung Fu when I practice. Everything is done in an optimal way so that we have optimal results. Does it suck? Yeah, right? But if I want to run a business that's profitable and live the lifestyle that I want to have, part of, running, uh, part of running a business, part of being a salesperson, is there are things that just suck that you have to do. Yeah. That's the way it is. So you've got comfortable with understanding I want to be objective in terms of what makes the most sense to do, mm -hmm. and then I will do that thing even if it, there's discomfort in doing it. Yeah. This comfort is irrelevant. Right. Right. It's only what's the right thing to do. Yeah. Like if this will lead to more revenue, if this will lead to a better paycheck, I will do the uncomfortable thing. Doing the comfortable thing, comfortable thing, doing the easy way out, if that's your standard or if that's how you, you know, live, don't be in sales. Right. Sales is hard. Sales sucks. Like right? there are a lot of things that we do is like, well, that's disappointing. <laughs> right? Deals dying day of, deals dying before, buyers backing out. Can't no one can get a hold of the lender, right? There are a lot of things that suck in sales. Yeah. If your fear is disappointment or discomfort, there are a lot of other jobs that you don't have to deal with that discomfort. True. So let's say someone's listening who's in a sales role. They understand that maybe they got hired something in a role where they weren't even wasn't explicitly clear. This is definitely a sales role. You're going to get a thousand no's. <laughs> There's plenty of people getting into the industry. Yeah, a lot of people suckered into the role. Getting suckered into the role. <laughs> getting sold the dream, and now they are more or less having sales conversations all the time. Yeah. And they want to be like, I'm doing this now. I've had enough success to keep trying, mm -hmm. but they're falling back and like, oh, that's hard or that's uncomfortable. I want to do it, but I, they're not wired instinctively to go. This is definitely the mm -hmm. best way to do this. Therefore, I will do that even if I'm, I'm, it's uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. If they're listening right now, what should their approach be to start finding a way to consistently make those changes? What would your recommendations be? I would say it's a matter of reframing, right? So if, if you might be looking, you might be looking at it's like, well, should I do it or should I not do it? Right? One's, uncomfort one's comfortable, one's uncomfortable. But you know what's even more uncomfortable? Your kids being hungry, not, buying pres not being able to buy Christmas presents, not being able to take your wife on that vacation, right? So it's not like, should I do it or not do it? It's like, should I do it and then be able to create a lifestyle for my family or not do it? And it's like, yeah, honey, sorry, we had another low month, right? Like as a sales manager, as a business owner, we have to hold the salespeople accountable. Right. But we're not alone here. The spouse is the other accountability partner. Right. Right. <laughs> so I think if you just remember that me being unwilling to be uncomfortable is putting my comfort over the needs of my family. Right. And if we reframe it that way, you might be more willing to be uncomfortable. Got it. Or almost even a, a reframing and just focusing on the timeline. Do you actually want to be uncomfortable for five minutes or do you want to be uncomfortable the rest of the time yeah. when you're at home with your family <laughs> trying to live the life that you want to live and you're right. not able to, to do it yet because your results haven't been there? Exactly. Got it. So, yeah, that's, a, that's, that's an interesting thing. So what should people do? I mean, if like... Say someone's like, all right, I want to do that. How should I do that? Like, mm -hmm. talk me through advice for someone who wants to, how to think about that, how to do how it. How to set proper expectations? No, no. How to um, make that shift internally and stick to it. Um, you know, it's hard for me to say because I only had to hear it once. Right. Um, and it was from a, a book. It was Give and Take by Adam Grant. And basically what he was talking about in there was that Anytime you're unwilling to do something, <laughs> you're putting your comfort over the need to, needs of your kids. Right. Like, that's all it was. Like, I read that once. Like, okay, well, there you go. <laughs> like, I can't do this anymore. Now, 
my easy way out again, I hired pushy salespeople, right? <laughs> um, but the reality is you just have to remember, like, it's your comfort or your family's comfort. <laughs> Don't think there's just, any other way to... Just keeping that as a mantra. Yeah. yeah. What if you are... What if you're, you don't have a family? What if you're a single guy? How should you, you just, you know, you're in your early twenties, mm-hmm. you're at your first sales role. You're, you know, low rent, if not living at home. So, and now you got to get good at sales. I can't say for sure in today's age of the twenties. Sure. But I know that when I was in my twenties, a lot of us were motivated by cars. Okay. Yeah. Right. So I think, you know, that vision board, which I'm not a big vision board guy, but a lot of people are right. But having that vision board, like the car you want. Right, like, well, how long are you willing to wait to get that car? Are you waiting 20 years or are you waiting like a year and a half? Because that's what we're talking about. If you're successful in sales, it's a pretty lucrative yeah. lifestyle. Yeah. You can basically determine your income, choose your income. You know, like the joke we make is like, you want to make doctor money, you got to ask questions like a doctor, right? Or the other thing is, you know, NFL kicker money. Like, that's, <laughs> I think that's the lowest in professional sports, right? You want to make NFL kicker money, right? You gotta, you gotta, you, you just have to be willing to do the things in sales necessary. Yeah. To close more sales. Yeah. Do you have any, uh, do, do you remember any sales or like stories where there was a, you got a lot of resistance, but you stuck to your process and, and did what you objectively know works mm-hmm. and then you got the sale? Can you think of some stories that you'd be able to share? Uh, well, I mean, there was this one recently uh, where, Appointment was booked. I listened to the lead manager call, right? Because the lead manager was in the office. Um, I mean, he's in acquisitions, but in this role, he was, he was operating like a lead manager. So I was, li- I was listening to this call. I said, okay, that guy doesn't sound motivated at all, right? And then Jaden, our operations for our wholesale company, books the appointment for me and our young uh, sales guy. I was like, okay, that was unfortunate. Like, that's a complete waste of time. Like, I don't know why I have to go to that one. But because I have a newer sales guy that I want him to learn our sales process. I will go to the appointment and I'll run it so that our young guy can see what it's like to run an effective sales process. We bought the house, right? Like it was crazy to me. Like the guy that jet, uh, that demonstrated no motivation on the phone. Like, no, like there's nothing here to me that said, this guy's going to sell his house at a discounted price. That works for us. We bought his house, right? And was able to wholesale in a very short period of time. So I would say the biggest thing is probably the biggest resistance is not from the other person, but from ourselves. Right. Right. The, 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 we will tell ourselves stories looking at uh, the, the notes that aren't true. Right. So I would say um, resistance from, from other uh, uh, prospects. These days, not so much because for us, uh, is that if they if they won't follow our sales process, we'll be like, well, it doesn't seem like you're really <laughs> that interested in selling. I think I look at their willingness to participate and work with us is part of the qualifying. So I'll give you another example. Um, we had a policy for the longest time on the realtor side where if a homeowner wants to look at a property, they had to come to the office. Like they had to come to the office to do a consult before we show them a property. And what we found was if they would come to the office and do a consult with us, there was more than a 50% chance they're going to do business with us. If they were unwilling to come to the office to run the consult, the likelihood of us doing business with them was less than 20%. So their commitment or willingness to participate in our sales process is part of our qualification process. Got it. Yeah. So you've almost, you've set up your process so that you're principally, you're almost sort of pre-qualifying to even run your process usually. Yeah. Right. Because if you look at it, the deals that give us the biggest heartaches are the ones that we forced to be a deal, right? The sale that like, ah, is this a sale? Is it not a sale? Well, let's, let's, let's just force this through. And then that's uh, just a nightmare, right? So, uh, but the ones that follow our process seamlessly are our easiest deals. They put up less resistance. It's an easier transaction. It's more delightful. No one in the office is complaining about this prospect or this client now. But the ones that we kind of force our way in, it's like, yeah, you know, it's not quite a good fit, but let's try to make it work anyway. They're driving the, the transaction coordinator crazy. They're driving the finance department crazy. Everyone does not like talking to this person. Right. So part of their willingness to work with us in our process 
demonstrates um, the whether we should work with this person or not. You've trained a lot of teams uh, in real estate and you know, just in general across the country. I'm curious what you think the biggest mistake most businesses are making in terms of how they run their process. Commitment to the process. And this is where I failed as well for the longest time. I mean, I would say this year, 2023, is the first time where we've measured commitment to the process. Before we listen to the calls, like, hey, why aren't you doing this, right? But we never actually asked someone, are you committed to following the process? Like, so the first thing is like, do you know what it is, right? And after that, do you know why we say it this way? And the next one is, are you committed to following the process? So we always stop, like, for sure they understood what. How well they understand and why, we're pretty hopeful that they understood the why. But we didn't have a written test prepared until very, very recently. Sorry, so we just finally got the written test prepared. Are you committed to following the process? It's a question we never asked, right? Because they demonstrated the behaviors. They were on the phones. They ran the appointments. Like, for sure, they're committed to the process. No, nope, that's just hope, right? So the biggest mistake I see a lot of business owners make is uh, not getting their people on board to follow the process consistently. Because like I was saying earlier, even though I had a bad process, I followed it consistently. I was committed to it. Right. And because I was committed to it, I knew how it was going to go almost every time, right? The unwillingness to follow a process consistently will yield inconsistent results. Right. And, uh, you know, our good friend Eric Brewer posted this recently, right? Where he said basically some people uh, that tend to be extroverted are outstanding salespeople inconsistently. But introverted people who will follow a process will be good consistently. We can run a business based off good consistently. We cannot run a, a business based off of great inconsistently. Yeah. Yeah, I think about that a lot, about the idea of what makes the perfect salesperson. Is it an introvert or an extrovert? Where, where should they stand in personality? And I think, maybe this sounds like a little self-serving, my pr I'm kind of an ambervert, mm -hmm. uh, which I think I think is perfect for the role, because the problem with an extrovert, I think, is that they're inclined to talk too much, mm -hmm. make it about themselves, uh, think that, that bonding is actually moving through the sales mm -hmm. process. The main problem with introverts I see is principally being set up to be an introvert means tactically you'll probably be better. Mm -hmm. You're able to listen more rather than talk. You're able to pay attention and ask the right questions and follow, be committed to following a process because mm -hmm. it's not about you, about you talking. I think one of the biggest problem salespeople face in general is burnout. Mm -hmm. And sometimes if you're enough of an introvert, I think of my dad, for instance, a pure introvert, uh, that talking to people all day can actually just, you just hate your job. You just hate it's what you're doing. Exhausting. It's exhausting. Yeah. And so I think people who can follow a process like an introvert, but aren't necessarily going to burn out mm -hmm. from following the process, meaning talking to people all the time is probably the key. That's, that's the, the keystone point of like thinking about what is it that makes the personality of someone mm -hmm. who would be great in the sales role. Yeah, I think the person that can reduce the need to talk like, that's it. If you could just reduce the need to talk, then you can't follow a process. But the need, like, the classic example, you hear an argument, is like, you got to get your last word in. You got to get the last word in. Right. The person who needs to get the last word in is probably not going to be very good in sales. Right. <laughs> right? Because you have that need to get that, these words out. I was like, I can't, go, I can't walk away from this without saying this thing. Those people are going to have the hardest time in sales. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say, yeah, it's like you need to get the extrovert to be able to shut up, mm -hmm. and you need to get the introvert to be able to have a deep enough why and motivator mm -hmm. to not burn out. It's kind of the sort of the balance of finding a, yeah. the right personality. Definitely. What would you say is the biggest misconception for someone who's in a sales role? Let's like say you're, you're a salesperson. Their biggest misconception about sales as a whole, like what's their biggest mistake they're making? Um, I mean... At a high level, I think the activity and behavior is probably the biggest mistake because, you know, the more hours you actually do work, the more money you make. Uh, maybe something else could be, you know, the, the mindset. As I put, this is probably the biggest one, is the mindset that I'm good enough. Mm. Um, you know, I posted something recently on Instagram, which was the Dunning-Kruger effect. And it has this curve, right, where you have this insane amount of confidence, un un insane, unreasonable amount of confidence, right? And then you kind of crash in your confidence uh, as your confidence improves and you go back up. And you have this thing, we call this a peak amount of stupid, right? Like you have unreasonable 
uh, confidence in yourself. And confidence is important. Like, I think we got to have confidence, right? But when I'm talking about unreasonable, unreasonable for a salesperson, we expect all, all salespeople to be un, like, irrationally confident, right? But even beyond that, <laughs> right? And so the, I have a, another friend, and we were texting, and he was at an event uh, where he listened to this guy who thought he was an amazing salesperson. Right, and he he even talked about how great he was a salesperson, which you know you have to describe how good yeah. you are. Probably not that good, sure. Um, so he went and talked about how good he was at sales, and he gave his sales training, and it was not very good. <laughs> and he commented to me, "I was like, I'm really disappointed because this guy told me he was a really good salesperson, and he's awful, <laughs> right?" And my comment to him was like, "You know, good people believe they're great. Great people believe they have room to improve." Yeah. Right. And I think it's that mindset, like, I'm pretty good. I don't need I don't I don't need to get better. And so I think if you're listening to this podcast right now, you're probably in the category as like, I have room to improve, which is why you're great. Right. But if you're good, you're not gonna listen to this podcast because you already got it all figured out. Right. Yeah. A lot of salespeople <laughs> think they they they've made a, a couple sales and therefore uh, there's a lot of um bias based on well, if I did this one thing this one way and mm -hmm. it worked, therefore I should do it that way. But that's what worked mm -hmm. rather than that person was motivated enough. You asked a better question earlier by accident and mm -hmm. now you're so committed and convinced that this part of the process is the way to do it, even though that was suboptimal. But yeah. because you got to sale one time with something else, you're now so committed to this one thing. I've seen that a lot with sales training. Yeah, it's, uh, I call this, well, they bought it in spite of you, not because of you. Right. Right. And I call this the Antoine Walker effect, which is basically like back, you know, when I was in college, Antoine Walker, you know, I love the guy, Cybertron, right? Number eight, employee number eight for the Boston Celtics. The worst thing that could happen is he made a bad shot in the very beginning of the game. So, you know, his three pointer in the very beginning of the game meant that he was probably going to shoot the team out of the game <laughs> for the rest of the game. So, the worst possible thing that can happen if you're a Celtics fan is for Antoine Walker to make his first three. Because then there's going to be a whole bunch of threes going up between him and Paul Pierce. Because for those of you guys, you know, that care about basketball, like him and Paul Pierce, like revolutionized how many threes are shot for a game. And that's the same thing as sales. Like, oh, I did this one thing and it worked really well. So I'm going to keep doing it. But is, is that the reason why you got the sale? Or you just kind of believe that's the reason why you got the sale? Uh, why, why you succeeded? The other, th other thing too is like the greatest misconception, I believe, for people getting into sales. So on the outside looking in, is that extroverts are naturally, naturally better at sales. And we kind of made that joke earlier, we we're judging people on social media, they're MLM, right? Um, they're naturally better at getting sales in that they're walking billboards. Right. Everyone knows what they do, so they are top of mind conscious. So they're getting super warm leads so they can close those sales because they're effective self-marketers. They're not great salespeople. Right. Just more people know what they do, which is important. I think one failure a lot of us as salespeople do is we fail to let everyone know exactly what we do, right? So extroverts are better at letting everyone know, like, you know, you're the pump gas and you'll bump at someone like, hey, uh, you know, they'll give you a business card. And like, I'm in real estate, right? I was at, I was at a swim school with my kids and this guy walks up to me, I'm wearing a Kung Fu shirt, right? Cause I just come from Kung Fu. I'm wearing a Kung Fu shirt. And the guy's like, oh, you know, you do martial arts. Start talking about this and that. You know, and he's like, oh, what's your phone number? Blah, blah, blah. It's like, okay, like this guy seems really nice. I'll talk to him, whatever. Seems kind of overly nice, but whatever. And afterwards, he's texting me back and forth, right? And he gives me a business card. And then as he's texting me, he's like, I just said, hey, you should probably know. Or what's your email address, right? And I said, steve at stunninghomes.com. And you should probably know I'm a licensed realtor. And the conversation went completely dark, <laughs> right? He was talking to me for only one reason. Add someone to add into his database, right? So the gift of gab right. means you're great at self-marketing. So that will lead to more sales because that's a great thing to get to phones a ring, but it does not mean you're a good salesperson. I think on the outside looking in, most people just think if you're an extrovert, you're good at sales. Yeah, it's almost like treating the idea of selling to many is the exact same conversation as selling to one. Yeah. And not understanding the difference between mm -hmm. talking to a crowd and being exciting at a party mm -hmm. and getting one person to want to take action. Yeah. There seems to be sort of a, a disconnect there. I want to I wanna shift for a second and ask you, apart from obviously the financial gains, what aspects of sales do you find most rewarding? The most 
rewarding part about sales is it's made me a better communicator, a more effective communicator. And that's helped tremendously within uh, leading an organization. You know, understanding, willingness to listen what the people that are working in your business are telling you. Um, if you're not good at sales, you might just kind of walk all over them, you know, and you might try to be a good leader and try to listen. But the tools we have to get someone to share more what's on their mind, to really understand what they're trying to tell you is really powerful because you want your people to feel like they're being heard, that they're appreciated, right? And you can't do that if you're not a good listener and you're not an effective communicator. And more importantly, it's made me a better uh, father and husband. Uh, the, the jokes I make, you know, about, you know, my interactions with my kids, they're real, right? And they're um, having, uh, creating psychological safety at home, so, yeah, creating psychological, psychological safety at work, creating psychological safety at home. I wouldn't be able to do that if I didn't have these sales skills, right? Because sales is so much human psychology and behavior. There's a lot of human behavior at home. <laughs> that we can learn to modify our behavior, learn to ask questions the right way so that your kids won't just tell you, how was school cool today? It was good. And that'd be the end of it. Now I can extract what was good about it. Tell me more about that. You know, I can ask leading questions. I can just make labels. And by just labeling, hey, you know, it seems like you're having a really rough day. They feel like we're paying attention to them and now they can speak freely. Yeah. Whereas before, I was like, "How how was it? It was good." Where do I go from here? Right. I'll, yeah, I've I've been watching like a a movie or a show or something with my wife, and I'll make a comment like, "Ah, he shouldn't have said that to her." Now she's gonna <laughs> review that, and she thinks, "Oh, you should like you should talk to people about being a a, a great husband and like the, how the relationship work." And I'm thinking like, "It's just a sales skill." Is all I'm thinking. <laughs> yeah. Of. I'm not saying that that necessarily makes you a better husband to say it that way. Just simply, that's how you get someone to open up in the sales conversation. Yeah. I know that that works there because human interaction, communication yeah. is exists everywhere. And if you're good at it to get someone to want to spend a lot of money or sell their home for a discount, mm -hmm. you're usually able <laughs> more or less to apply it to other interactions as well. If you're willing to do it. So that was the other thing too, though. Because even mm -hmm. though I learned these skills, right, I wasn't using them in the office and I wasn't using them at home. And it was like, why am I not doing this? And once I made a conscious effort to do it, now it's better. So I was only doing it on sales, but not doing it in the office, not doing that at home. And so I, it, it took a moment of introspection to realize I should do this in other places. Do you remember that moment of introspection? Do you remember what made you start doing it? Uh, yeah, I can say there was a moment where someone in our organization completely flipped out, mm. right? And a valuable key member flipped out and I was listening to it. I was like, oh, I was, Clearly not doing a very good job of listening here, right? So then I started making a conscious effort uh, doing that. And I'll say that was probably sometime in 2019, 2020. And then uh, same thing at home, you know, like my wife said something and I was completely dismissive, you know? And looking back, I was like, if I would have just actively listened there, <laughs> I could have saved myself a lot of heartache, <laughs> sure. right? So it was just... Um, you know, we call them after action reviews, right? Like just like the military does. And we do it after action review, after every sales call. Hey, if we have a bad situation. We do it after action review, we do some introspection. Well, how was I responsible for that outcome? What can I do to improve this right now? Make sure that outcome doesn't happen again. Yeah, when I'm coaching salespeople, I'd say that's one of the biggest hacks to get them better at sales faster is to just say, now you apply sort of an after action review to every aspect of your life. Yeah. Try and figure out why that went wrong, mm -hmm. what you said wrong, what you could have done better in this other part that's not, revenue is not on the line mm -hmm. in this exact thing, but if you can start applying it outside of the conversation, it, it actually becomes easier to apply it when revenue is on the line, so. Yeah. And I actually do after action reviews with my kids when they screw up, you know? Like, hey, what happened? What did we learn from this? How can we make sure this doesn't happen again, right? So I had this conversa conversation with my kids. And then last week, uh, Vivian, the middle child, right? So we're late for school. He's like, why are we late for, why are we late for school this morning? He's like, I got caught up talking to mom. So, okay. So what are we going to do to make sure that doesn't happen again? I was like, this is not the way it's supposed to go. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. They're, they're, they're picking up a little too early on the techniques. Yeah, they're learning. It's great. What's uh, in your sort of 
career right now and you're, you're or if someone says like what do you do mm-hmm. as it relates to a sales role how do you sort of describe yourself man this is pretty bad these days uh like like what do you do it's like ah well you know like <laughs> i've seen your instagram profile it's a lot of things <laughs> yeah so um i mean the thing i would say i most uh uh how i identify as right now predominantly is a uh, sales trainer yeah and i think you know there's even though i'm a podcaster I think the biggest way that we can help people is giving information on the podcast and then teaching people to get better at sales. Like those are the two biggest things. Now I've always been fascinated by entrepreneurship, right? Business capitalism, right? Like I've always been fascinated by that, by that. And that does generate a lot of, uh, uh, revenue for a lot of people. It changes, changes their lives. And then within that entrepreneurship business role, sales is a subset that I didn't really geek out on until the last, five years now, I can't believe it. Um, where I would say that is where I, I spent a lot of mental power where I'm not working and I'm thinking about it. I'll watch a movie. I will hear a conversation, right? I was having lunch by myself yesterday and I kind of overheard this conversation on, on the other side. I'm just like, oh, you could have said that differently. You know, it's just, um, we just watched this uh, Warren Buffett uh, not Warren Buffett, opposite Warren Buffett, Bernie Madoff <laughs> <laughs> documentary, the exact yeah. opposite. Yeah. Um, and like, you're just like, oh, the way he raised money was he just pushed everyone away. Oh, you know, we don't need money now. But, but we, what even qualifies you to invest in me? And look, if you want to look at my books, but well, maybe we're just not a good fit. Like, all he did was the takeaway. Takeaway sales. <laughs> and everyone gave him a stupid amount of money. <laughs> all right. So, but I can't help but just see human behavior in all these different situations and, and taking that and improving our sales training. Yeah. What would you say is the biggest hurdle for you professionally right now? Like in terms of your sales trainer career, what's the biggest challenge for you? Uh, so we have our annual planning on Monday. So I was thinking about this quite a bit yesterday. Um, I would say the biggest challenge is still me, right? Uh, so, you know, our focus for the last couple of years has been uh, execution and accountability. And I think I'm resigned to the fact now that I am just not the right person to hold people in this organization accountable, right? It's been my biggest weakness forever, right? Uh, and I would say my biggest struggle is holding people accountable to doing what they said they were going to do. An uncomfortable conversation. Sure. Right? And this might sound completely hypocritical, right? Earlier we just said, like, you got to do the things that are uncomfortable. But I've done everything I think I can think of. It's not getting the results that we need. So I would say probably going back to hiring another coordination action officer like we had before. Got it. Probably the biggest struggle. And then strength wise, what are you do you feel like I'm incredibly confident in this part of what I'm doing as a sales trainer? Uh the most confident thing I would say is uh, you know, I went through and like wrote down like you know, superpowers, went through unique ability and all these other uh, exercises to figure this out. It's learning something at a deep level and explaining those concepts in an understandable level, right? Where anyone can understand it. So taking complex concepts and distilling it into understandable, anyone get it. Yeah. At this point in your career, is there anything, if you could, I mean, I know, like you said, you wish, you don't regret the high pressure salespeople that you were sending out Mm -hmm. there. Is there anything you wish, if you could go back and make an adjustment what would you have done differently? Be a better salesperson, right? <laughs> um, I left so much money on the table over the years because marketing in 2023 is drastically different than marketing in 2012. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. So like when I started doing my own PPC marketing, we buy houses, you know, sell my house fast, all these other things. I had so much opportunity there that I squandered. Right. Right. And look, here's the thing. I was super profitable the whole time, <laughs> but I was good enough then to, to make, you know, a decent living. But knowing what I know now, I should have been making millions a year, right? Knowing what I know now. Because I could have scaled our operation. I could have taught more people within the organization how to run an appointment effectively. Um, starting off on what they're willing to accept versus what I'm willing to offer, right? Because right now everyone's focused on what I'm willing to offer, but we know Margins are better if we start off with, with what you're willing to accept. If I can get you to say what you're willing to take first, not letting them think about it, like, oh, it's just, 
drives me crazy like how much money I left on the table. I mean, I promise you it's multiple millions of dollars. <laughs> I believe it. Yeah. I believe it. Yeah. So for someone listening to the podcast, if there were for either from our conversation or just anything else you want to add in, what if there were to think of sort of three takeaways mm-hmm. to take away from this conversation? Let's just say it's a salesperson in mm-hmm. particular, someone who's working in a sales role in some capacity. Maybe they're a sales leader, mm-hmm. but they're in sales in some way, shape, or form. What are the three takeaways that they should they should take away from from this conversation? Um, I would say, you know, first one is committing to follow the process. So having a tactic isn't good enough, right? Like committed commitment to following a process. I would say number one, um, and then right behind that is number two. But I would say right behind that is you know you got to put yourself aside. You know, we talk about this in our sales training. You know removing you from you know the meat bag right so taking you yourself out of it and you know being the person that you need to be so that you can serve the person that's in front of you uh that's number two um let's see what's number three behind all that um can't think of it off the ex- right right now based off our conversation today so from those two let's, let's focus on the that sort of meat bag part mm-hmm. this idea uh which i know is can be a I love this concept. It's always how I operate as well, but some people sort of struggle to. It's grasp weird this the first time you hear it. Talk about it a little bit, a little bit more about about how maybe someone who's this is their first time hearing any you yeah. know what you're talking about. Sure, how to think about that. So if you think about like Grand Theft Auto, right? We've all played Grand Theft Auto, where like you're flame throwing people for absolutely no reason, <laughs> right? So you you you're playing this this game. You got a character that you're walking around. You're controlling this character, right? Imagine when you're in the living room or you're on the phone, you're controlling the character, right? From a third person's point of view. Someone else is watching this interaction, right? So like right now, you and I are having a sales appointment. You're the prospect. I'm the salesperson. The person that's listening to this right now is observing this, right? From this conversation. Be that third party, that third person observer running, that's checking out the appointment you're running and see, observe, How's the other person responding? Think to yourself, where am I in this sales process? Am I still in setting expectations? Or am I in pain right now? Am I in money right now? But also being aware that if I didn't do a good job of setting expectations and the homeowner is talking about money and talking about motivation, that you don't continue the conversation until you've fully finished setting the proper expectations. Because if you don't, this appointment can go haywire. Right. So you got to observe like you're a third person uh, that's watching this. And again, the examples we've used is a Grand Theft Auto or a puppeteer, right? You're just controlling this character. You are not you. You're controlling the person that's in front of the prospect. It's really, I actually hadn't thought of it this way. And it goes back to a little bit more what you said at the start. It's about being objective, you know, mm-hmm. it being able, if you're not in your own head in the sales conversation, mm-hmm. but you're a separate party viewing it, you can go, okay, well, he or she, you, mm-hmm. should have done this differently because right. you're able to be more objective. You're able to separate yourself from that, from that moment. I always thought about it as a way of being like, oh, I would be afraid to ask that question, mm-hmm. but that's not me there. That's my avatar I'm controlling. Right. So the same way I'm not going to walk down a street and use a flamethrower on a bunch of people. <laughs> that's an avatar doing that. But okay, I could, that way I can push and maybe ask a little bit more questions, but it also allows you to be more objective about running the process. Yeah, I mean, just think about, we watch sports, right? And we're screaming at the TV, watching a quarterback. Like, why did he miss that throw? So you knew which throw he should have made. Right? But he's in the heat of the moment. He's got someone breathing down his neck, right? Like someone's trying to hit him from the side as he's throwing the ball. He's making a decision in the environment. But you, who is not attached to getting hit by a linebacker on a blitz, you see the right pass. Right. It's the same concept here. Right? You got to observe it objectively, not experience the heat of the moment. Yeah. So yeah, that makes it makes a lot of sense. Makes a lot of sense. So that making sure as a salesperson you find a way to do that. And mm-hmm. for the entrepreneur, for the business owner, not just learning a tactic and not just learning a process, mm-hmm. but actually being committed to that process. Being committed to it. It's the 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 people that we attract in the sales. And this is no judgment on salespeople because I am the same way and you're the same way. Right. Right. We generally are, we have a hot, if you look at predictive index, uh, well, let's just look at this, right? Generally speaking, if you're in sales, you're generally a higher D and a lower C. What does that mean? 
Higher D means you have a strong ego and you're very competitive, right? And you don't do really good being told what to do, right? So that's the high D. But then what's the low C mean? Low C means rules are for other people, right? So like, for example, um, someone asked me like, why'd you do that? Like, we're not supposed to do that. I was like, yeah, I know, but like, that's for other people. Right. Like, rules don't apply to us. It, the sign didn't say this means you. Right. <laughs> yeah. Like, it's a good rule for society. <laughs> right. Just not for me. Just not for me, right? So this is who we attract in this, in this industry. And so if that's the case, you don't like being told what to do, and you don't believe rules apply to you, then how do you stay committed to following the process? And again, it, has to go, it goes back to remembering the desired outcome. What is the desired outcome we want from our career in sales? And we want this desired outcome in career in sales. Then you have to decide, I want this process because I want the results. And I will follow the process and, and because of the win, not because I feel like I have to follow a process. Love it. You mentioned that desired outcome. If you're thinking about Steve Trang in uh, 2033, oh, it's about to become 2034. You're on. Oh, sorry? 2024. <laughs> yeah, so I'm saying, so let's say it's 10 years in the future. Oh, 10 years in the future, okay. And we're, we're it's you 10 years in the future. Okay. It's about to become 2034. Okay. I'm saying the exact same time 10 years from now. So yeah. fancy way of saying 10 years from now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What would you want that Steve trying to be doing? What did you, what does your day to day look like 10 years from now? Man, 10 years from now, I can't, it's a long way yeah, away. Yeah. I can't even fathom it. I can only think about what I want to happen within our, our, our sales training organization. Um, um, I mean, I, I would hope that by 10 years from now, uh, everyone that's working here today is retired, right? Like that for me would be the desired outcome. Everyone here, financial freedom. Um, and then we've made dramatic impact in a lot of people's lives. Um, you know, maybe it's like, uh, um, you know, for better or for worse, a lot of people look at Grant Cardone as a preeminent sales trainer, mm -hmm. right? I would like to be able to supplant that conversation where like, yeah, you know, this is the process, you know, it's kind of funny. Every once in a while, here's like, yeah, I pulled the Steve Trang on. I was like, well, I mean, I'm not sure that's the right way to put it, <laughs> but okay. Right. Um, so I would say probably, you know, some sort of inspirational, uh, inspiration for salespeople on how to run an effective sales process where you're not doing something to somebody, but you're doing something with somebody. Yeah. So that, I guess in 10 years, that's what I, my hope would be. But day to day, let's see. I mean, at that point, Emily's 16, like she's getting, <laughs> she's in the middle of high school. I don't know. I, Cause what we talked about is when she's 18 and she's out of the house is probably gonna be traveling more. But yeah, I, I can't, so I can't, far, I can't yeah. articulate that vision because right now I am so focused on what I want to see our business do in 24. Yeah, we got an annual meeting in a few days. It's hard yeah, to think about and that's where the years. And that's where the head's been at. Fair enough. Okay, so then for someone listening who's maybe actually not in sales yet, mm -hmm. maybe they're younger, maybe they're in a, a hourly job and mm -hmm. they're inspired by your journey, inspired by the stuff they learn on this podcast and they want to get into sales. Mm -hmm what's a piece of advice you would give them thinking about starting to explore this career? Um, if you're thinking about this career, um, I mean, I think a, like do a little bit of homework, understand like it's not the, I'll, I'll break it down to the out, out, out uh, outside perception of our industry. Right. Say for a realtor, for example, everyone thinks that realtors just have happy hours and drink Mai Tais. Right. Right. And are always traveling. They work really hard. Yeah. Right. And then you look at like pharmaceutical sales or medical sales. What do we think of them at? Think of them as they're hanging out at the country club. They're hanging out with doctors. They're playing golf all day. This is not what sales is. Right. This is the best part of sales. This is not what sales is. So I think just doing a bit of research is understanding that sales is not something that's easy and you just walk in and you crush it. Sales requires a lot of self-mastery, a lot of discipline, a lot of disappointment and rejection. Um, but it's one of the best things you'll ever do because you'll make way more money being good at sales than you can than almost any other career that doesn't require natural talent. Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, yeah, you can make a lot of money more. Like you could make that Otani money. It was amazing. Right. So you can make sports money. You can make at, like, or you got athlete money, um, a professional entertainers money, like all the other stuff. 
There are quite a lot of natural talent. Yeah, let's assume that people <laughs> listening are not on the path to yeah. being an athlete. Yeah, like I made a joke this morning. I was texting one of the guys that he got hurt. Um, like, hey, we need you healthy because like you, you know, you're important to the like you're one of the top guys in basketball, right? And like for me, I'm I put myself in top 15, right, <laughs> on the basketball court, right, of 10. So, um, for a person that you know doesn't have natural athletic or natural uh, singing or whatever abilities, I don't think there's many careers as better than sales for creating the lifestyle that you want. I wholeheartedly agree. It's one of yeah. the one of the pieces behind this this podcast in general is it, getting people inspired to get better at it mm-hmm. because I, I find a lot of people might maybe get into it like you said they're attracted to the like two percent of the time the instagram post of the role rather than what actually got mm-hmm. you to being able to be in that position to begin with and they don't achieve that result in three weeks <laughs> in three months you know in a year and therefore, they've resigned themselves to not going on that journey of sort of self-improvement and self-mastery as a salesperson, mm-hmm. as trying to get better at having conversations with people and getting people to take action. And therefore, they actually never achieve the results that got them in the first place. So I want yeah. that to be an inspiration. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's a three to five year plan. It's not a three right. to five weeks plan. Right. Well, uh, this has been great. I'd say lastly, uh, I mean where you might as well shout it out where are, are the listeners on this podcast or the viewers on youtube where else they can reach you and where should they should look for your content uh so outside of closemoresales.com uh i would say you know on instagram at steve.trang uh real estate disruptors are is our real estate podcast um yeah i would say you know uh so real estate disruptors on youtube itunes spotify and then uh you know our community sales disruptors.com it's you know one of the most exciting things that we're working on because we we are bringing Sales training that's super expensive, the masses. Yeah. At 97 bucks a month. Like, I'm so excited about that. So, but yeah, I would say those are the places to find us. Find me. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. This, then thanks for your time, Steve. Thank this you. Morning. Thank you. It was this, fun. Is, this has been the Close More Sales Podcast. I'm Ian Ross.